thankfully the pack got it thankfully the package section that we just missed uh, in the recording is not the most important one everything that comes following this is the most important stuff but it's good to know the, uh, the about the package so you can look at the slides or maybe look at the lecture from last year if you need more about packages so yeah the workspace is a collection of more packages but they share common dependencies like so they have a cargo lock file which um, is shared among among the packages and uh, but that's not uh, really very important um, for most projects you will not touch on this it's just good to know that it exists um, and then a package uh, the concept of it like as we looked at the previous slides is that uh, it uh, sorry uh, it wraps uh, one or more executables or library files which are called crates in the rust lingo but um, a package like in another language you would have called this a package so like there's a lot of confusion often between like a crate and a package like what's the difference what why is it called a crate in rust and not just simply a package and um, to look at it at the top level like the compiler will compile crates individually so each crate is an individual compilation unit and cargo which then holds the package information builds the whole package in one command and uh, when we go even deeper, we will know that crates can further be organized with modules. So if you just quickly go back to this slide, um, we see that the package describes uh, its contents by adding metadata like name, version, authors, and addition on top of the crates. But uh, oftentimes, and in many projects, crate and package is used interchangeably, especially for libraries, because oftentimes they mostly do the same thing in that case. Um, yeah, so for adding dependencies to your projects, um, they're defined at the package level, like we discussed. And uh, there is this website called crates.io, which is where all of the crates come from. So if you want to look for a package, you can go here, you can search, search for maybe random, and then you can look at uh, various random number generations, maybe error handling. So this is where all the packages are pulled from when you add them to the cargo sample file. That's good to know if you want to look it up in a web GUI. <clears throat> okay, uh, but uh, you can also specify custom sources like GitHub. So if you have a Rust library on GitHub that you want to use that's not available anywhere else, or you want the latest version, or for some reason you want to go straight from master, uh, you can just put a Git repo directly in there into the cargo.toml as well. And then it will do its best to pull from there. But uh, I think the requirement is that there should be a cargo.toml in the Git repo as well. So Rust can actually recognize it as a Rust package. Yes, so uh, this is just a quick example of a package folder. We're going to come back to this. So let's not discuss it right now. <clears throat> to get started with uh, uh, using cargo, you probably touched on this already, but I'm going to repeat it anyway. Uh, cargo new is what you use to create a new project package. And the convention in Rust is snake case. So new and then package underscore whatever. You don't have to start with package. And then to build your project, you have cargo build and you have cargo run to run the main crate, which also builds before. So if you have a project with one executable, then this will run by default. But uh, we'll come back to that in the exam. OK, so let's look at the uh, crates. So now we have spent quite some time on the concept of a package. But uh, what's a crate? So that is a either a library or an executable program referred to in Rust as a library crate or a binary crate. Um, so essentially, if you uh, I think you have worked with C, before or man c++ maybe but um, when you build with that you have a build target and uh, the main file that you compile in c++ or rust becomes an executable like a exe file on windows or an elf binary in linux or something else on mac uh, and or if you compile a library you'll get a dll or an so file or something like that or just a dot lib uh, in Rust, you can also compile to either of these, just like in C and C++. And the source code for a crate 
can be subdivided into modules. So that's the next step after after the create. So um, like we looked at in the package section, a create can be each create is its own uh, compilation unit. So every create gets compiled into a binary. That's like how you think about it. So for each binary that you want to generate, you need a new create in your package. And uh, like we also said, it can be used interchangeably with package many times, at least especially if you have just one create, one package, then oftentimes it's, uh, it's interchangeable. And uh, that's also to make it easier for non-Rust developers to understand package, but when you're into the Rust ecosystem, then talking about crates make more sense. Yeah. So that's very little about crates, but uh, that's basically what they do. So what when it really gets interesting is actually modules, because this is where you actually get to structure your project um, by adding multiple files, modules, folders, and everything. And I remember when starting with Rust, this concept was quite confusing because it very, works very different from, like if you consider C and C++ again, um, you have the concept like hash include, you have to create headers and implementation files separately. Uh, Rust does not work like that, like most other languages. But uh, unlike, say, uh, Java or, or Kotlin, um, code files that you add to your projects does not automatically become a part of the binary or your project. You can't simply add a file to a folder and say, this is now part of my project. Um, so they're used to organize code into logical units. They're called modules. And they provide isolated namespaces within the code. So you can have functions with the same name in multiple modules um, working in different contexts, for example. And the source code for any crate can be subdivided into one or more modules. So this is how you work with multiple files and folders in Rust. And normally, this is done to organize the code. So you have related functionality in the same module. Or you control visibility, so you can have lots of implementation functions that the users of your code, especially if you're writing a library, don't need to care about. So you can have a public-private um, scoping of symbols in the source. So you can have pu public structs that users of your code can use, or you can hide it be so behind, make it private, and just have your own library deal with it, and then the users can have a simpler interface. So just like in every other language, this is just a way to organize code. Um, creating a module in the language is used done with the mod keyword. So if you write mod space keyboard, you're creating a keyboard module. Or like we're going to look at in a practical example, um, you can use the file hierarchy to create modules at the file level. So we have uh, you can have at your source directory, you can have a module name being a folder which then requires a mod.rs, or you can just have any file.rs and it becomes a module just because it's a different file. Uh, and we're going to look at all of this <clears throat> in an example afterwards. So modules have various visibility rules. And by default, just like with the uh, uh, variables in Rust being constant, modules are private by default. So uh, exposing types, everything is opt-in rather than opt-out, which uh, generally seems to be a pattern that recurs in Rust. And to make something visible to the users, you need to make it public specifically and explicitly with the pub keyword. And then you have sub-modules in other modules, because you can nest modules. And they will have access to everything in their parent regardless of whether the parents' functions are public or not. Uh, and the parents can access everything in their direct children if they are public. But the module itself does not have to be public for the parent to access it. So this will be more, become more clear when we look at it uh, in the examples. So for structs, uh, their, their visibility is defined on two levels. You have it per type and per member. So the person struct can be public, but its name, age, and the uh, um, phone number can separately be private or public. So 
you can have a public struct that completely hides the data and just exposes functions. Or you can expose some of the data, but keep the rest hidden. So that's up to you and your design, the design of your code, whatever works, whatever you need, and what will be implementation detail members or what uh, you need to do. For enums, they have a single visibility specifier on the whole type, and hiding individual enum values is not possible. And that's uh, kind of good because that would defeat some of the purpose of having an enum, which is a known amount of constants that you can compare to. So if some of those were hidden, then you couldn't re rely on the type being complete anymore, which, uh, which is not good. And then we have uh, nested modules, um, like, like we looked at in the overview. That the child modules can see the contents of their parents regardless, but parents can only see the public content of the children, but not the private ones. And grandparents, so that's two levels above the child, they cannot access your grandchildren except through the parent, unless the child module itself is also public. So, of course, you can make everything public and you don't have to care about this at all. But that's uh, not a good idea in general, especially if you want other people to use your code. So let's try to go through a practical example of this, um, unless there are any questions so far. Uh, I think most of these concepts will become more clear when we have a look at it in practice. Okay. So let's go and do this. So if we were to start completely from scratch, then uh, we would have started with cargo new and called this example project, for example. But uh, for today's example, I've already done this step and I'm using IntelliJ ID as uh, my preferred ID for Rust. At the moment, I feel that has the best autocomplete, the best code understanding of the code and the best integration with the language in general. But the Visual Studio code also has a pretty good uh, Rust implementation, to my knowledge. And when creating a project with Cargo New, we get the source folder with the main. And then we also have this Cargo Tumble file. So right now, this declares the package. The name of it is Rust Crates. I'm the author, and it's the 0.1 version. And we're using the 2021 edition and currently have zero dependencies. So this is what defines the package itself. And by default, we have a file called main.rs, which then becomes a binary crate. So this file is, becomes the crate, which then becomes the compilation unit. And then when we build this project with a cargo build, which is already built, then this produces an executable in the target folder under debug. There, rustcrates.exe. I don't know if this text is too small, but uh, it says rustcrates.exe, which is then an executable crate. So by default, most projects are executable crates. Um, if you wanted to create a library crate, you would create a new file called lib.rs. And you could use that to write functions here. Let's just quickly write the function test. That does absolutely nothing. We could do cargo build again, which then builds the entire project. And now we see we have a library file generated as well, which is prepended pre with lib and then Rust crates. So if you deleted the main file, you would have only a library. So if you want to create a library, you, you use lib.rs by convention instead. But for now, let's go back to the top. So now we have taken a quick look at how to create a binary and a library trait. But uh, let's start looking at modules because that's, uh, that's what, this, what today is really about. So we have a couple of options for what kind of an example we will do. Um, most of them will be really simple. So my main 
ideas is uh, we can do a taxi fare generator or like an airplane trip uh, program. So since we did a taxi example last year, I think we're going to go for like airplanes this year, but really it doesn't matter. Uh, so our client wants a program that uh, can generate the cost or of a ticket flying from one destination to another one. That's it. So we can simply write the function compute cost uh, that takes the distance of the flight as a float and maybe also the duration as a float. Although that we just assume this is milliseconds, although it's not really important. The point is we now have this function in our main file and we can simply print the cost, cost of trip and that's compute cost for 100 kilometers and that's going to take yeah, one hour even though that's a very slow flight. And we need to return the value. And for now it simply is that. So the details of the cost is not very important, but the point is we now have this function in main that we are calling. And we see that the trip costs 100 something. Actually, that's one millisecond. So let's not make it millisecond. Let's actually make it hours. Um, so if this was a real program, then at some point we would have a lot more functions. So, or maybe we had multiple different functions computing cost if this was for trains and buses and everything else. So we would create a module with the mod keyword. So maybe we created a airplane module. So everything inside of here is a part of the airplane module. So it's not exactly the same, but if you've worked with C++, you could have created a namespace airplane. Um, they don't really function the same way, but um, at least that's something you can relate to if you've worked with it. So what we're going to do is we're going to move compute cost into airplane. And for fun, we're also going to create a bus. And we're going to create a function with the exactly the same name. Suddenly, our compute cost no longer compiles. We run this, it's like, what's compute cost? I don't know. Uh, it's not recognized anymore because we have hidden this function away in a module. So if we wanted to uh, get access to it, we would have to go through airplane and then use the colon colon syntax, which is the same as a namespace in C++, which is why I use that as a comparison for those of you who, have, who are familiar. And uh, we have to call compute cost. Uh, but since this is not public by default, we cannot call this function. It even says it if you hover over it, function compute cost is private. Uh, so like we looked at in the slides, we have, if you want this function to be able to be called from outside, we have to give it the prefix hub. So now airplane compute cost is a public function. So now this works as it did before. We do cargo run. It says that the cost is 100. So let's go air trip and bus trip. And likewise, if we wanted to use bus, um, that would no longer work because this is not public. So we have to do the same in the bus module. Uh, and like you can see right now, it works as it did before. So for bus, let's say the duration, it's a lot cheaper. So now we can separate them. Um, so now you can see that this function can have the same name in both, mod both modules without crashing with the other one. Um, however, if we, for example, didn't want to write airplane before everything else, there's the concept of using. So we can use our airplane compute cost function. And now we have pulled this function from this module and into the root of our rate. So now we don't have to prefix with airplane anymore. We can just use compute cost because we pulled it out of the module. This is something you're probably going to do a lot of, um, especially with uh, third party libraries. You sometimes don't want to prefix everything. You will be pulling out the 
functions or types that you need. Sometimes Trust does this list, the this ID does it automatically if you're using it. But uh, now, if you also wanted to use bus compute cost, there would be a name clash. So uh, this is another reason why we're using modules. So sometimes you don't; it's not a beneficial thing to use it because you can end up with name clashes, especially if you have lots of third-party libraries that can have, especially like functions like compute or very generically named functions can collide easily. So for now, let's just keep it like this. Um, and now our client wants to have multiple ways of computing. And if this was a real project, this main file would quickly grow. It would become big and we would have lots of things and it would be very cluttered to have everything implemented in the same file. So the next step is to start organizing our projects with multiple files. So we go and create a new Rust file. You can do this in a file explorer, in the terminal, or just right click like I did. And we're going to call it, uh, for example, costs, cost computations. So now that we added this file, we have access to a module called cost computations. Um, so this works slightly different. So right now you can see the ID complaints. If this file is not in the module tree, and that's because this file is not a crate, so it will not be compiled. It's also not part of a crate, so it will not be compiled. Most files that you add by default, it's not part of a crate. The convention is main and lib, like we discussed, and those will be recognized by Rust and the cargo system to be compiled to an executable. However, any random other file is not part of a module, it's not part of a crate, so it will not, will not be compiled. This is why in the main files, which is the a crate or in the library file, doesn't really matter, but in one of the crates that you have, you have to specify that there's a module called cost computations, and you sort of declare this module here. And now this goes away, because now this module is included in the crate and will be compiled. So after creating a file, you have to go to the crate root and you have to just declare that, hey, hello, this, uh, this module exists. So this is, some this is similar to doing mod cost computations like this, except uh, it's just the same concept, except now you're sort of saying, hey, there's a file that uh, declares this module. And then we can sort of move our, our code into this other file. We can keep this structure in here if you want to, but for now let's just focus on let's focus on the bus. So well, by putting this at the root in this file, um, we now have access to it through cost computations and compute cost. So the file name implicitly means there's a module like this at the top. So sort of you don't have to write module inside of the file because the entire file is automatically wrapped in this. So everything you put here will be part of cost computations. So now we have the same thing, except we've moved our code to another file, which makes it easier to organize a project. Um, but say we wanted to keep, um, keep tracking costs of other uh, means of transportation. Um, then we could keep adding it to this file as well, but um, like we've done before, that can also grow out of hand. We only have one file. We could run into a name collisions, like if we have, or we can, like we'll have to do compute train costs and add multiple function names that uh, could be the same, but not always the best thing either. But for uh, for the purpose of this explanation, let's create a new folder or it's called package in, uh, in idea, but uh, it's just a folder. Let's call this for costs instead. So we have this costs folder 
and we're going to move computations inside of here. Uh, and then we're going to rename it to bus. So now we're going to organize our modules by using folders. So we have this cost module, which is a folder instead of a file. In main, cost computations doesn't exist anymore because we obviously moved the file into the cost module. Now we can say, oh, we are going to declare our cost module, uh, but that does not work. And the reason that it doesn't work is because we have to go in here and create a mod.rs file. So if we remember from the slides, uh, the structure for using a folder requires a mod.rs file to be at the, the root of the folder that is a module. So now we are allowed to say mod costs. And this becomes the same as if with the file. Everything in this folder is wrapped in mod costs. So everything in this folder, every file sort of has this wrapper around it. And we can create multiple files inside of this module. And they can all see each other because they're part of the same module. So in the bus, we see that hmm, this file is not part of the module tree. But in main, we did add the costs folder and say that, hey, this is a module. And we have our mod.rs. So again, not every file is automatically brought in to be compiled because this crate just knows that there's a folder named costs and this implicitly declares a module. And this is the mod.rs. So in the module.rs, we have to make sure that we say bus is a part of this module. So for every file that you want to be part of it, you have to include it in the mod.rs instead of the main.rs. Uh, so then we could say, OK, now we want to compute costs. And we want to access the bus, but that's not possible. And that's because in the module, this is not public. Like everything is private by default. If you can't find something, it's probably private. So we have to say either that our bus module is private, is public, which means we can now access it through cost bus. But uh, in our case, we don't want the user to care that much about what submodule this exists in. So when we create files inside of folders, it's the same as creating them in the source file. They become separate sort of submodules of the costs module. So instead of exposing the module itself, we can just say modbus is declared here. And then we want to publicly use the compute cost inside the bus function. So now we are using the mod file to declare a public interface for users of our code to interface with. So by doing this, we're saying, take this compute cost function in the bus module and make it publicly available to the costs module, which means we can now just call costs compute costs directly, which means this module.rs now defines the interface. And then we can have lots of implementation details in all of the other files that we have. Um, sometimes, though, if we're going to use compute cost to uh, be the name of multiple transportation units, uh, that might not be what you want anyway. And you might, may just want to expose the module itself. But for now, we're going to focus on the bus part. And we're just going to say that we are exposing compute cost to everyone who wants to use this. Um, so, but this function isn't very complicated. It's just a distance and a duration. Uh, we want something more to our computation. So let's add another file just because we can and call it, for example, bus ride. Yeah, that's the rest. Let's also rename it. RS, so it's actually a Rust file. So now that we added a new file, before we forget, we should go ahead and declare that mod bus ride exists. So now it will be compiled. And in a bus ride, we want to create ourselves a struct. And we're going to call it a bus ride. And this is where we're going to group our data now. So there's a distance 
duration. And that's all we need for now. So we have this now. Now, if we go back to our bus module, compute cost, we're going to get rid of these guys. And we're going to simply call it a ride instead. And we want to use bus ride, but um, we can't see bus ride. So why is that? Well, we can try to make it public, see if that helps. Now we can see it. So, and it decided that we should go from create, cost, bus ride, and bus ride. Uh, we could also go the other way. So, but we're going to look at that when we go to come to nesting. But for now, uh, we are able to include the bus ride from this one, this other module. So, the reason we can't see it by default. Um, is because in our module, we have the costs module. And then we have a bus ride module, which is a sub module of costs. And then we have our bus module, which is another sub module of costs. And uh, since everything is private by default, bus cannot see, bus can see everything up in costs because it's a parent but we cannot see into the other children of uh, the cost module. So we cannot see what's in bus ride and, unless this is public. Um, so now we have access to the ride and we want to use our ride distance and our ride duration. But that's not possible. And if we remember from the slides, that's because on a struct, you have to specify public first on the type and then on every data member that you also want to be public. So we can make the distance public and the duration public in this case. So we go to our bus and now we have access to that data as well. That's, that's the takeaway from this part is that for a struct, you have to make it public both on the parent level and on the mem data members that you want to be public. We can later remove this if we don't want it to be public after all. Uh, but this is not very nice for this case since everything of this, everything like this is sort of meant to be a part of the costs module. So instead here in our uh, mod, let's publicly use our bus, our bus ride bus ride so let's take the bus ride type and make it available to the costs module and then instead we have access to it much more easily and also users of our module can now access the bus ride directly so since we want to make everything available in this module and every other file is just for easier organization, easier for programmers to think about it and reason about it. We sort of pull everything up into the costs module instead. Uh, so the next step in computing the price for our bus tickets is that we want to have a new file and we want to call it a ride type. Again, we have to remember to declare it. So we have a ride type. And in here, we're going to create an enum. And we want our bus driver, our ride, to be a direct route. Or maybe you have one with stopovers. And the direct route will be more expensive than the long round route. But uh, the same concept applies. So in here, we want to have a ride. Uh, but we want our ride to also have a type. We're going to call it ride type. Now, again, we don't have access to this. Uh, and that's because our ride type is not public. So we have to remember to make the enum public as well because everything is private by default. Uh, however, on, the, on enums, we do not have to say public direct and public stopover. Um, so remember that means on enums, everything, if you make the type public, then all of its 
enum variants will also be public by default. So making the enum public makes everything else public. So that's uh, that's a takeaway. So now I can make this a write type. And like we see, it imports it from here, but we want to make it available for everyone. So we want to go to write type and take this type and maybe make it publicly available in the cost module. So now I can get rid of the middleman. And in here, we have the basic compute cost. Let's just also create another function. Uh, gritty cost computation details. And we want this one to take a ride as well. And this is where we do our distance times our duration. And we get the base costs. We set that the base cost to be that. And then we want to do something depending on the ride type. So we're going to match on the ride type. And at least in this IDE, you can hit Alt Enter and you can get the rest of the patterns. And we're going to let the multiplier. If the ride type is direct, it costs 3.5 times as much. And if it's a stopover, you get half price. So this is how we use our gritty computation details to actually compute the cost. And then the final cost is the base cost <coughs> times the multiplier. And in our compute cost, we are going to simply call this one. So since, but so this is to provide an example for the final part, which is going to be uh, nesting rules. Um, so here, we don't want the cost function to have access to the gritty cost computation details. Those are supposed to be private. Uh, as such, this shouldn't really be public. So let's make it private to start. With. Now in our cost module, we can no longer, we cannot publicly use the bus uh, gritty computation details. Every user is forced to use compute cost. But compute costs uses this one internally to compute the cost. So say we wanted to have more implementation details than just this function. We could create another module using the mod keyword. Let's call it just detail. And we can move this inside of here. And suddenly ride type disappears. That's because uh, we now have to use that package inside of this submodule because remember this file is just uh, implicitly wrapped with module bus um, so inside of this one we have to use it we have to also use create costs ride type in here and we also have to use our bus ride now we have access to it inside of this submodule so that's important like imports or uses are not inherited and we don't need write type up here anymore. Uh, but now, if we try to build, um, it no longer knows what gritty cost computation details are because we move this function into a submodule. And this is when we have to consider the nesting rules again. Since this module is a parent of the detail, it can only access public functions inside of this module. So we have to make this one public, and then we can call it here, but only when we import it. But we can also just say detail like this. So we could have used it. We could have used the detail really. But in this case, we're going to do it explicitly. Um, now, if we go up one level to our costs module, we can now try to public use bus detail this one, um, but that's not going to work since the module is private. Now, if we uh, remember back again, uh, a grandparent can only access its direct 
child. So that's the parent, which in this case, the parent is the bus module. And the grandchild is the detail module. And then the cost module is the grandparent. And it can only access what's in its child, which is this mid-level. It cannot automatically access this module, which is, which is a part of the bus module. And the reason is that the module itself is private. Everything is private by default. So we can make it public. And then this would work. But we don't really want this to be public because that's the point of creating the module in the first place to hide everything inside of it. So, but uh, parents can access public methods of their own child modules without the module having to be public. <coughs> so, excuse me, uh, before we Keep going with the next thing. We're just going to take a quick five minute break since I need to get some water. So if it's 107, let's meet back at 1313 and then we'll wrap it up with the rest of the nesting and we'll have a, a quiz at the end to recap everything. So see you again in five minutes. Sounds good.
Okay. So I hope everybody's back. <clears throat> Let's uh, keep going where we left off. So uh, the last thing we did was uh, uh, move the computation details into a submodule with the purpose of taking a look at how the relationship between submodules and parents uh, works. So um, let's just have a look at what happens if we go the other way around, because now we just saw that uh, going from the costs module and accessing details inner module does not work uh, because the module itself is not public. But for the parent, which is the bus module, which is this file, it can access everything in here that is public uh, because this module is visible by default to the parent. Uh, however, if we wanted to create a function here called um, this is private, that just prints uh, private. <clears throat> um, then this is private. So if we go back up again, we cannot we cannot use thus this is private because well it's private. Let's get rid of this. Um, however. Um, we can use it inside of the bus module itself because it's inside of the same module. So here we can use this as private. Uh, additionally, uh, children of this module, like the detail module, can also use this as private because uh, children have automatically have access to everything in their direct parent. So since this is private, it's private in the parent. Uh, the child can use it. If it was public, it could also use it, but the children have access to everything in their parent modules. So that could be one reason of having a submodule to just uh, define a library of functions here, and then you can use a submodule to use them. Uh, or in this case, we're using it as an implementation detail to further abstract this. Now we can do this by nesting folders as well. We could have costs, bus, and then have files instead of that folder. Uh, but at some point, like you have to make a choice um, if uh, you want to use how many files you need. Like you can just sometimes add this module directly and start using the functions in there. But uh, anyway, the children can access private in their parents. And um, yeah, so if we keep going, I don't know if you want to keep going further down. Well, if we do that, we can technically, like as an as a fun example, we have our detail, which is private. And this is private, is private. And we can't access this as private from this uh, costs module. <clears throat> but if we call create a function here, call it child private, that calls this is private. Uh, and we make the module public, then we can suddenly use um, our bus, detail, child private. And now through this child private, we're able to call this function. So we kind of skipped a, le a level. But um, yeah, there's, there's no reason for that except to show that grandparents can in fact call grandchild functions if the module is, pub, uh, is public and the functions are public. Um, and I think that covers more or less everything you need to know about the basics of uh, modules and nesting them. Um, we have structs, we have enums, we have files and folders used as modules. And then we have the concept of uh, using uh, functions or types from other modules and publicly using them to make them also available to uh, owners of this module. So now through the costs module, if we go all the way back up to main, we can now go through costs and we have access to everything else. Like we have compute costs, ride type, and bus ride. And those are modules inside of the cost module. So we define them here. So they are become a part of the compilation. If we didn't 
say that this is a module here and declare it, <clears throat> we would not be able to have access to it and the file would not be compiled. So we have to, in the root mod.rs in the folder, which now is a module, uh, we have to declare every other module that exists here and say that this exists and now it adds them to the compilation. And then this is this this step is optional, but it's quite normal and you'll, and you'll see it many times that uh, uh, the root mod.rs will declare publicly use important types from its uh, its child modules. The other thing that is quite normal is to have a module called Prelude and that you do this inside of that one instead, which says basically that, hey, this is the cost module and we have a Prelude here, which exposes everything you're going to need to get started working with this module. Instead of by default making it publicly available, you have the option to do this. And in main then, instead of including costs, well, you have to declare it so it's compiled. But now you could go here, for example, you could go abuse and you could say costs prelude and everything. And this is a pattern you'll see in many libraries. This is also how the Rust standard library works. Like the reason you have access to the string type is because string is put into the prelude. Otherwise, you would have to go through std. Yeah, where is it? Is it in string? Yeah. Otherwise, you would have to do this to find the string. But uh, <clears throat> the uh, Rust uh, uh, runtime actually lets you access some very many common types directly, such as the string, without having to prefix it or use it. So technically, every time you use a string, it would be the same as going publicly use standard string string. But you don't have to do this because it's part of the uh, compiler prelude. So. But many libraries create this prelude class. And then we could also create a mod, like a create level prelude that uh, you can use, uh, lets you import everything in your create in a simple way. But uh, sometimes this creates name clashes. So that's why um, this pattern exists. Uh, for our example, we, and we can leave it, why not? And now in the main, we can simply use everything we set. So that the bus, costs <clears throat> and then we will have a compute what did we call it again we called it compute cost it's interesting if it doesn't actually recognize it let's see if we figure out something right yes so <clears throat> we forgot something uh, <laughs> The fact that we put uh, this mod this this into another submodule means that we cannot access bus bus rider write up anymore uh, because they're actually in the parent module right now. So uh, if we wanted that, we could go the long way, create costs, and then access bus. That gets uh, messy really fast. So there's one thing we didn't mention, and that's uh, in terms of using things. So let's look at that because it's quite important and nice to know. Um, so when we're using it here, we're using bus ride, but we're importing it from the top down. So we're going create, which is the root of our crate or the main file or the top level. Then we go into the cost module and then we get bus ride. But uh, what if uh, we wanted to go the other way from the top and go up? instead. So let's get rid of this. So we have access to it directly. If we instead wanted to go from the bottom and go up, so instead of having all of this prefixing, let's do it go the other way. So create starts at the top level and imports. If you want to start where you are, like in here, you could start with super instead, which goes from detail and then goes one level up. And then from here, we have access to bus ride because we imported bus ride here. Um, but um, <clears throat> we don't have access to anything else. So maybe we could go two levels up. And then we could uh, find our ride type. So this is going from the bottom and going up. And we can use the super 
this is private as well. So now we're going from the bottom up instead of from the top down. So that's that can be useful here as well. We can go super bus ride since we are local to this module now. So now start in bus and we go up to costs. So this can be cleaner to look at sometimes, uh, but other times you want to start at the top. So it's just good to know that you can do it. And that's the same here. Um, we're now, this doesn't exist anymore. We're importing compute costs and this takes a bus ride. So let's just create a bus ride. Say we're going 55 kilometers. Remember the dots, otherwise it's not a float. Takes uh, half an hour and we want to go a direct route. And since it's it wants a reference, we can do this. And then if we build, it's, everything should be working our, out for us. And then we can go clear and cargo run. So we now know that our 55 kilometer, 30 minute bus ride take costs 96 kroners. And this is now using the compute cost function inside of the bus module, inside of the costs module that we have imported here. So that's the basics of everything. And at the top of everything, you have the package that defines your cargo .toml. So. Um, this is packages, crates, and modules at the basic level. So let's go back and wrap up with just a couple of more slides before we go and do the quiz. Uh, with Cargo, uh, there is something that's known as the convention over configuration. So <clears throat> when making this project, we didn't really have to write a lot of config files. In fact, all we did was Cargo new, and we get this, so we didn't have to do anything. And also, as soon as we had our main.rs file, Cargo immediately knows and builds this into our executable that's in target debug and lies here. And when we created our lib.rs file for a little bit, <clears throat> we automatically got our library called librust underscore crates. And we didn't have to configure anything. We didn't have to say that uh, you know, if the file is main.rs produce, produce a binary executable. Cargo just knew this. And that's because there's a convention in Cargo, like there's a standard by which everybody, everybody follows it more or less. And then that lets you not have the right conf uh, skip writing configuration files. Like if you want to create a C or C++ project, you have to write CMake files, you have to configure everything every time, and it takes a lot of time. And that means, yeah, we don't have to write configuration files. We can use those conventions to make projects uh, faster. And that's preferable because other REST developers know these conventions if they work with it for a little bit, and it will save you time. So if we go back to the folder structure that we looked at way back in the beginning, our package folder is the root. That's this one uh, known as rust underscore crates. And this is the folder that holds the cargo.toml file. And the lock file is there as well. Um, um, and then we have the toml file for that. And then we have the source folder, which is this one. That's where our main.rs lies. This is where all the source code is by convention. And in there, you can have the lib.rs, but you don't have to. For library crates, you will do this. For binaries or executable binaries, you will have main.rs. You can have both, like we saw, or you can just have one of them, but you need at least one crate. Then there, you, in here, there's a convention that you can create a folder named bin. And in here, you can create everything you create in the bin folder becomes a new binary crate. So if you want multiple binary crates and not just main, you can create as many as you like in here. So this is good for a client server program where you need a client and a server in the same package. Then you can create bin slash server.rust and bin slash client.rust. And then they can they become compiled to uh, server.exe and uh, client.exe or whatever operating system you're on. 
So they become two runnable binaries and you can write them differently, but they can share all of the code that's in your library or in just in the source folder and all of the modules there, they can share that. So if you write the same networking code, then you can create two executables, one for the server and one for the client. So that's, and you just put it in the binary. I'll show you in a moment. And if you have a multi-file executable again, <clears throat> then you also can create folders in here with, uh, with individual modules. But let's do that. So let's go to the source and create a Rust, not a file, but a new folder and call it bin. So if we call the folder bin, every file we put in here will become a new crate. So let's call it server.rust. And let's create client.rust. Uh, now it complains the main function does not exist in this crate. So here we actually have to create another main function and say, this is server. This is the server. And we can copy that into the client and say, this is the client. Uh, this makes one change when you're making your projects. If you now go cargo run, you'll get an error saying it doesn't know which binary to run because now you have two more binaries, client and server. So you'd have to specify that the binary you want to run is the server. So if you hit run there, you get this is the server. Or if you run the clients, it's like this is the client. Or if you run the name of the package, which is Rust underscore crates, then you run your main file. So now you have to specify because you have multiple binaries in your project. In your project. So if you wanted to create a server client uh, projects, that's one way of organizing it without having to configure anything. You just put it in the bin folder. Then you also have a convention instead of on the root folder, you have source and then you have benches. In here you can put benchmarks that you can use uh, for measuring, for timing operations. And uh, if you have a library and you have math intensive functions, you can use write benchmarks in here and then you can time them automatically. You have examples, which you can, uh, if you have a library again, you can write some examples and this will become uh, binary crates as well, but not really crates. They will just become examples that you can execute. It's a by convention though. And tests as well. You can write <clears throat> how to have a folder with tests that can import this and run tests on them. I don't know if you discussed tests yet, but uh, anyway. But um, and on the top, quick topic on the tests. In addition to writing the folder, you can also write them a folder like a module called tests, and everything in here will be interpreted as tests if you write a test function and go write something. Then this becomes a test as well. Um, so that's a quick overview of some conventions that you can follow. <clears throat> so finally, some useful cargo things. When you're ready to deploy your project to production, you just want, don't want to deploy um, debug anymore. You can run cargo build with dash dash release. This will create an optimized binary, which will be like, at least depending on your project, like three to 50 times even more faster than your debug build. So if you want, when you want need maximum speed, you're finished with developing, you build your release version and you get an optimized binary, which is like insanely fast compared to the debug one. Cargo check is like a linter. This will validate your project without building it. You run some lint checks. Uh, update will update libraries that are locked. So you have the cargo lock file that we didn't talk about. But if you have a dependency, for example, random, and you use specifically, instead of specifying every version, you just specify 0.8. When you first pull this library, it will download the latest version, 0 0.8.4. And then five months down the line, maybe they updated it to 0 0.8.5. But since you only specified 0.8 in here, the cargo lock file will say, keep in mind that, okay, you are currently on 0.8.4. And since you only specified a minor version, we're not going to actually update the library to 0.8.5 um, because we're locked to 0.8.4 since you don't specifically care about this version. Um, <clears throat> you should commit uh, the lock file, by the way. Uh, both the TOML and the lock file should be committed to Git. Um, so if you run cargo update, this will simply update it from 0.4 to 0.5. 
if you only specified 0.8. Fix will try to fix some of these uh, lint checks that have failed. Uh, format will uh, format your file so it follows the Rust convention. So if you run cargo FMT in this file, maybe it might do changes. Yeah, it did some changes to it. So that's nice to do as well before you push. So you follow the coding conventions. You don't have to do anything else. And Clippy is a slightly more aggressive linter that will be more angry with you if you make any sort of mistake or warning. And if you want to read further, there's the Rust book. Uh, there's a, the cargo documentation, and you can look at the crates. Nice. That's uh, quite a lot of information. But uh, once you start working with it, it's, uh, it's quite simple and actually a very pleasant system to work with. Uh, it's just be aware of uh, visibility modifiers and uh, focus on crates and modules and the package thing sort of just wraps everything. Um, I will put the example code on GitLab, even though it's not um, very coherent, but at least it's uh, something to use as an example. Um, before we take any questions, let's go ahead and do our recap quiz. So let's see if we get the room code and get everybody inside. I will wait here for a couple of minutes while people join in. Okay, so seven, let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Yeah, we are we we're supposed to be twelve, so we'll let a couple of more join. And then we'll go in one minute. Yeah, let's just assume everybody didn't like it. <clears throat> okay. So we have a couple of questions, and then uh, just to recap, and then uh, after that, we're free to, you can ask any other questions that you may have, and then we'll be done. So let's go. First question is, What's the default module visibility? Nice. That's good to remember. So like variables are const by default, modules are private by default. So again, Rust is a lot about opt-in rather than opt-out, especially when it comes to security, safety, and uh, generally programmer mistakes. 
So, second question is Can you specify visibility on enum values? Oh, did I forget to? Yeah, actually, no is correct, but apparently I forgot to mark it as correct. So, <laughs> well, at least nobody gets an advantage. But uh, yeah, that kind of sucks. Anyway, this is uh, <clears throat> this is the correct one. It's uh, you just had to specify it on the type. And thankfully, you don't have to do this because enums can get big. I hope I didn't forget on more questions. Anyway, is it possible for a grandparent to access grandchild functions? So yes, this is possible, but you have to make every step of the way public. So you have to take each module and make make the modules public. And not only if you don't do this, then of course the grandparent cannot do it. But uh, if you ensure that every step of the way is public, then you can do that. Um, but by default, only the parent can access modules of its uh, uh, the uh, the functions of its uh, children that are public. Fourth question, uh, what file do you use to describe project dependencies? Nice. Yes, it's, it's the cargo.toml, which uh, stands for Tom's Obvious Minimal Language. So there's that. Final question. Uh, how many types of crates can you make? One, two, three, or four. Maybe it's not exactly clear, but I guess maybe the question was unclear. But um, summarize, you have binary crates and library crates. And while you can create them in multiple places, so you have the bin folder, the source folder, and uh, like that. Um, in the end, you just have the binary executables and the library crates. So in the end, there's two types. And nice. So Hattie is the winner. Congrats. Um, uh, and everybody else did uh, really well as well. That's good. I disabled timing to uh, have a, something to matter. So it's better to just look at who got the most correct. So congrats to Hattie. You did well. And uh, that's the end of the presentation and also the end of the day. So if there's anything else, then it's just going to be questions. If not, um, I will be back on Wednesday. So you can send me feedback on Discord if you want. If you like the practical, um, the combination of like slides and practical coding, or if you prefer just practical, or if you want uh, more slides, more quizzes, and I'll try my best to incorporate that. So. Yeah, just Thank just you. a quick question. If you're using if you're using a file as a module, then by default it's private, so you cannot make it public, right? Or is there a way to make a module which was created by just convention of a file 
are public. That's an interesting one. Let's. Uh... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a uh, it's a good one. Let's uh, see. Uh, so we have our uh, bus module, which is a file, and here it's bus. Well, I guess we can just say public module bus, and then that's it. Okay. If we go to main now, we should be able to access the uh, bus, bus. Yeah. So it's just uh, since it's uh, there's a parallel between doing uh, since mod bus bus with code is the same as um, this is the, the same same declaration format as doing it for a file. So mm -hmm. if we were to declare pub mod bus here with code. Uh, it's just the same here when we declare the module that we declare it with public instead, and then it becomes then the file module becomes public. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. That's uh, very yeah, uh, flexible and very powerful um, mechanism. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's a question: Will the code be available? Yes, I will put this uh, project up on GitLab, and I can post a link in Discord as well. Nice. If that's it, then uh, I guess that's the end of today. Great. So thank you very much. Um, just give me a second. I will check if I can make you. Yeah, I think once I gave you a host permission, that should work, right? Yeah. I think it worked last time like this. Yeah. Yeah, in, in case uh, I will be on Wednesday as well. So in case something is not working, but let's try um, let's try you starting starting that up. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. So...